Today we are going to be talking about the issue which won't go away uh, across the world and especially in the UK, which is the cost of living crisis and inflation more generally. I'm very happy to have with me Richard Murphy. Uh, Richard is a chartered account, chartered accountant uh, turned economist who has been writing about public policy and taxes and inflation at taxresearch.org.uk for longer than I've been on the internet. Uh, that blog's been around for, for a while. Um, so he's a bit of an institution. Um, he's also the author of several books, including uh, The Courageous State and Money for Nothing. But recently, Richard's really been hammering uh, the UK government about their plans to deal with massive inflation and the cost of living crisis. So I think that's what we'll be focusing on today. So Richard, um, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. So right now, across the world, we are facing the highest sustained inflation rates that we've seen for decades. And in the UK, this seems to be particularly bad. It seems to be a little bit worse than most, uh, most other rich countries. Could you maybe give us a little overview of, of how we found ourselves in, in this current cost of living crisis? Well, that's quite a long explanation, and there's no absolute certainty. Let's be clear. Actually, I'm a political economist rather than an economist. Um, the distinction is significant. Economists are there basically to explain how markets work, as far as I can see, with all the ridiculous assumptions that they make to justify how that happens. Um, I think you're pretty familiar with those ridiculous assumptions, so I'm not going <laughs> yes. into them. <laughs> That's where this whole movement came from, I know. Um, political economy is about the power relationships that actually influence the allocation of resources within society. So it doesn't ask the question what so much as why. And I think that's a really important distinction in this case. Why are we in this mess? Look, neoliberalism fundamentally failed in the summer of 2008. It was really failing from 2007 onwards when we saw Northern Rock begin to fall over. And I was writing about that then. Yeah, my blog has been going since before Northern Rock collapsed. Um, three blogs a day on average, more than three blogs a day on average for over 16 years now. Um, and why did it fail? Because the whole logic of a society built on a neoliberal premise that the return to financial capital is the paramount goal within that society is clearly unsustainable. Um, you are not meeting the needs of most people. You are trying to pivot reward towards a very small group within society itself. There is an upward flow of funding, a fundamental imbalance as a consequence, and a lack of necessary financial regulation, which builds in inherent risk. Now, all, add all that together, and we had a market failure. That was the moment when it would have been opportune to have changed direction. And indeed, I was saying that at the time. I mean, I can look back and say, yeah, I told you so. Because with others, um, people like Anne Pettifor, Colin Hines, Larry Elliott, the editor, uh, editor of The Guardian, Caroline Lucas, now, of course, a Green MP, but not then. She was an MEP at the time. Um, oh, various others. Um, Jeremy Leggett, um, heavily involved in energy, um, alternative energy issues. We put together the Green New Deal. Now, there had been one reference, apparently, to this in the States beforehand, which we'd never seen. But we put the idea together, of course, building upon the 1930s idea of the New Deal and sticking the world green in front of it, because that was a fundamental shared opinion of those who did the task. And we were saying there's a financial crisis, there's going to be a downturn, there will be a recession of some sort unless there's a government intervention. We need to actually take action to deal with a food crisis, an energy crisis and a financial crisis. And let's be blunt about this, um, that didn't really happen. Um, nice to have thought it would do. It had a moment in the sun, um, so in a sense did I. I was at things like the April 2009 G20 summit invited by Gordon Brown's government. Um, and so were others around at the time, I think, getting more attention than we did afterwards. And certainly at that point, explaining that we really did need to address these fundamental failures, our inability to talk about how we were going to become energy sustainable, food sustainable, and how we were going to get rid of these regulatory market and financial imbalances that had created that particular crash. Uh, 
what didn't happen nothing with regard to energy at all nothing with regard to food at all and the del delays with regard to finance have frankly been so long that we still haven't addressed some of the issues in question but we did get a fundamental reaction which was to elect a Tory government well a coalition government let's be blunt in 2010 uh, Gordon Brown didn't convince the world that he had done as good a job as I actually think he did. I think Gordon Brown, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Gordon Brown about some issues of his time in office, um, and I don't pretend I am. Um, but with regard to his management of the global financial crisis 2008 to 10, I think he was outstanding. Um, he didn't get the reward for that. People didn't want to um, return a Labour government, and it probably was a tired administration by then. And so we got a Tory administration. What did we get as a consequence? We got austerity. So instead of actually using the resources that we were making available within the economy by then, using the quantitative easing process started by Alastair Darling, let's be clear, where well, the government fundamentally authorised the Bank of England to create new money to fund government expenditure because it was lacking confidence that the markets would supply the scale of funding required to cover deficits that were necessary for, because the government knew it couldn't cut spending, but tax revenue was going to fall way short of expectation then um, that QE process was not used to best effect. By 2010, I was writing that we needed a green quantitative easing process, whereby we direct, redirected the funds of QE away from restoring the finances of the UK's banks, which is what they have been used for since uh, 2009, and instead directing them towards building social housing, new transport systems, energy infrastructure, insulation, new solar panels, offshore and onshore tidal power, uh, wind power and tidal power, and various other things as well. All of that could have been done, but it wasn't. We went for expediency instead of resilience. We went for consumption rather than investment. And the consequence of all that was that we were in a very poor state when we hit a further crisis or crises, of course. We hit the crisis um, of 2020, which was COVID, um, unanticipated. So we were thought at the time, but actually widely recognised as being a risk, um, including in the government's own risk assessment programme, but completely unprepared for. And then that required further deficit spending. QE was rolled out again. This time, I think the QE was for a fundamentally different purpose. Um, it was not just to support banks. It was actually to basically fund furlough and company support and so on. However, banks still won. The amount of money that they hold on deposit with the Bank of England as a result of quantitative easing has now reached a sum around £900 billion, um, completely gifted to them, no effort required on their part and on which they're now being paid interest um, at 2.25%, likely to rise significantly in the near future at considerable costs to the government. And so, as they would say to the taxpayer, although I don't agree with that. So we had a failure to address the imbalances. None of the absolutely fundamental underlying issues that existed in our economy, low pay, low productivity, were addressed. Um, indeed, in fact, in many ways, things like low productivity were completely not addressed by choice um, because there was no investment as a result of QE. The direction that it provided was to stimulate house price increases and extra market um, financial speculation rather than to in any sense stimulate real investment in the economy and work I've done has shown that the rate of corporate buyback of shares and dividend payments rose substantially over the decade that QE ran for. Um, how much by? Well around one, what, 30 percent, one third of the FTSE 100 managed in that period to pay out more by way of dividends or share buybacks out of their profits than they actually generated in profits. In other words, they artificially manufactured profits to make dividend payments. And I have with a colleague, academic colleagues, shown how that is technically possible. But it demonstrated how fundamental ne fundamentally neoliberalism survived in the UK in particular. And of course, we diverted our entire effort away from actually doing anything useful with the political energy of the country into having a fight over Brexit. We moved much further to the right. The Overton window shifted. Brexit was actually there to undermine any element again of productivity by destroying exports 
by destroying confidence in those markets, by actually devaluing the pound, but not providing the opportunity for people to export to exploit that, but to push up the price of imports. Again, all of these things exacerbating fundamental weaknesses inside the UK economy, whether you know or not you think the social dimensions of Brexit are good or not, and I admit I don't. Add all that together, we were weak when we got to the reopening from COVID. What happened when COVID reopened? Let's be clear, some people did, of course, do quite well out of COVID. They didn't go to work, or rather they worked from home in most cases. Um, they were often the quite well paid, me included. Um, and let's be honest, I know I'm in that category of person because you know, university professors, and I am a professor at Sheffield University, are amongst the better paid in society. I didn't go to work for a long time. And therefore, I was able to save, in effect, the, the time and effort involved in commuting. Um, I didn't go out, as we couldn't. Uh, the consequence was there were a large number of people who were in that situation who then went and wanted to splash the cash, which is, of course, how they think they get their validation as human beings through conspicuous consumption. Read um, Torsten Veblen's work on conspicuous consumption if you want to know about that. Pretty impenetrable, I admit, in the original, but well worth looking at for, to understand what the purpose of this term is and how it destructive the whole idea might be. They wanted to buy new flash cars, they wanted to buy kitchens, they wanted to do household extensions, all those things they put on hold. And there was a boom around the world in demand for these core items, particularly raw materials for things like building and microchips for items which have been deferred like new cars. As a consequence, there was a shortage in demand. There was supply chain disruption. We reopened too quickly. The claim that COVID was over was, of course, complete nonsense. COVID is still not over. I'll tell you that. I'm still suffering with long COVID this summer. Um, I have been in touch with my doctor today um, because I assure you I have absolutely ghastly sinusitis, which is a long COVID sign effect and which makes sleeping quite difficult because it's just damned uncomfortable. And it's been going on all summer. Uh, when I last had COVID. And so COVID is not over, but we were told it was. People therefore went and splashed, as I say, the cash and tried to do so. There was at that moment a demand driven inflation. And I don't think there's much doubt that was a demand driven inflation. It was short term. We knew that by Christmas, even 2021, many of the issues which were causing the stress in particular, things like timber prices, which had shot through the roof. And of course, the price of freight itself, because so many ships literally could not land because there was so much disruption in ports, was beginning to all sort of come back to normal. The Baltic dry index was dropping. Um, timber prices were falling. Some of those core indicators, um, even copper, um, not necessarily, um, however, much to do with microchips. They remained in short supply, and I accept that point. But otherwise, most things were back to some sort of order. Then come February 2022, we get Putin invading Ukraine, which most people had, and I think I put myself in this category, just sort of spend, suspended disbelief that he would be quite so stupid. Um, but he did, and I didn't expect it. I should have listened to my mate John Sweeney. If you don't uh, follow John Sweeney on Twitter, I recommend it. John Sweeney, S-W-E-E-N-E-Y, an old mate of mine with whom I made many television documentaries at one time, um, who's now been working heavily in um, Kiev and around Ukraine for some time and has been tracing Putin for years, which is one of the things I did with him at one time on television. Um, he has been documenting the whole of this war and what the consequences are there. But what we didn't anticipate was the knock-on effect. What's the knock-on effect of that? Well, but fundamentally, of course, there was gas because Russia has used it as a weapon to counter our um, economic blockade on them. Um, there's a knock-on effect for oil uh, because oil and gas tend to run together in this sense. And we have not received the support from OPEC that many countries were hoping for. They are not terribly friendly towards the USA, for example, over issues around Saudi Arabia and other, other places, particularly with regard to you know, pretty difficult diplomatic issues like, you know, is it right to murder journalists in cold blood? Um, and then 
the next knock-on effect was around foodstuffs. Um, wheat, uh, because uh, Russia and Ukraine are breadbaskets, which have supplied enormous quantities of wheat, not so much to us, but very heavily, for example, to Africa, where Egypt is absolutely dependent upon Ukrainian wheat and is not getting enough, and fertilisers, where 25% roughly of the world's fertilisers come from Ukraine and aren't coming from Ukraine, and therefore the risk of falling productivity in agricultural production is high, and therefore prices are increasing. So we imported not gas prices significantly, because we only have a very small dependence upon imported gas from Russia and Ukraine, but we certainly did improve, uh, import food prices. We certainly did import oil prices. And the reaction of our government was, and our Bank of England was pretty illogical. They said, oh, we've got inflation. Therefore, we must do what we always did in the 1980s and 1990s. And I'm old enough to have been around right through these eras where they increased interest rates to try to crush inflation. It didn't particularly work then, by the way. Um, by 1992, inflation had been crushed by matters, matters quite apart from interest rates and, and remained low, for, for, frankly, almost ever since then, in many ways, in real terms, compared to inflation. Um, and so they tried to do that. It obviously didn't work because there was no reason why it should work, because there was no domestic driver of inflation by the beginning of 2022. As I mentioned, you know, raw material prices were fundamentally under control. Demand had rebalanced at that point, I think, pretty significantly. The nature of inflation was imported, and yet we were left with this problem. There was the inflation in the Bank of England trying to kill it by increasing interest rates, which was exacerbating the problem because people were not only now seeing the inability to pay energy prices and road fuel prices and food prices and various other things, of course, which as a knock-on effect were rising, but they were seeing the threat of their mortgages increasing. And that has a knock-on effect onto rents because many landlords are heavily geared, i.e. they have large mortgages on their rental properties. So they have begun to push up rental prices as well. What's the consequence of all of this? We are in a potentially calamitous position because we've imported inflation, uh, because we've built a non-resilient economy, which when we could have had a resilient one with regard to both energy and food, but did not. Um, and the result is that we are now exposed to inflation to a greater degree than many other countries as a consequence. Plus, we have a Bank of England that is particularly dedicated to neoliberal thinking and the ideas around um, using interest rates as the only well, literally, it's the only hammer they've got, isn't it? It's the only tool they've really been given, apart from quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. Um, and they want to use that to hammer the economy at a totally inappropriate rate. And therefore, people are going to be suffering. It was a long answer to your question, but that's how I see where we got to this point. Thank you. It was it was a long and very, very good answer. Um, I think, you know, if I had to sum up, I'd say essentially, we because of uh, decades of lack of investment and lack of preparation we were completely underprepared for this crisis uh, well for the multiple crises that we've faced um and you know in response we've basically just seen more of the same a complete lack of ideas from our government and our central bank in how to actually address these things uh creatively because they they just saying you know let's let's cut taxes and and increase interest rates which is exactly what they did in the 80s um and i think one one thing i'd like to ask you about which which piqued my interest and a couple of people actually in the chat did notice it is you, you said that in the 1980s you didn't think that the very high interest rates played that much of a role in bringing down inflation um which is a really interesting claim because i would sort of you know my my perspective has always been that they did but you know at what cost <laughs> you know that that was my perspective but do you think that there were other factors which brought down inflation and the interest rate rises were maybe minimal or incidental in their impact the evidence of academic work around um interest rate changes is that they take 18 months to two years to flow through into an economy to have any significant effect. Um, and that is because there is a lag, um, inevitably, between a change in base rate and a change in interest rates in the actual market. Um, and that's obviously perhaps an even bigger lag now than it was in the 80s because there tend to be more fixed rate mortgage deals 
more fixed rate bank deals than there were then. And you know, I stress I was around at the time and I'm working from memory, but I think that's definitely true. Um, but even so, they did seem to take some time to have impact. There wasn't an absolute certain correlation between, oh, bank rate has changed and whatever else. We, of course, had the mayhem moments like Black Wednesday, where everything was just you know, completely skew with in 1992 because of the exchange rate mechanism and everything going wrong with that. But overall, the reasons why we got inflation and why inflation was cured were very much more because of actual movements in fundamentals. For example, in 1992, it wasn't pushing inflation, interest rates to 15 percent. OK, for a very short period of time that solved inflation. What solved inflation was letting the pound float um, downwards, um, which was necessary because we've been in the exchange rate mechanism uh, at too high a value. And once we were allowed to float the value we were happy at, it didn't have a significant import, uh, impact on imports, but it did boost exports. Um, and therefore the thing rebalanced sort of of its own. My argument is that actually the time lag was always too long for it to have been inflation to that caused the rebalancing of the economy. Actually, the rebalancing of the economy happened because demand and supply adjusted to, in effect, market price signals faster in many ways than interest rates could react um, and produced the change in the nature of supply that was necessary to rebalance. Yeah. I don't believe in equilibrium and I don't think anybody on earth should believe in equilibrium because it's a completely false concept. But it did rebalance broadly supply and demand in a way that was not influenced by infra interest rates, is my argument. So we're simply talking about the temporality of the whole issue here. You know, what is the most significant time lag of consequence? And I would say real world adjustment to pay and prices and reactions to supply and demand as a consequence had a much bigger overall impact on supply and demand and the elimination of inflation than interest rate changes did. I might be wrong, but that was certainly my impression when I was working at that time. And remember, running real businesses, because I was, I was a chartered accountant, but also running real companies aside from being a chartered accountant at that point in time. So I was senior partner of a firm, but I had several other companies that I was involved in running, making real time decisions on how we may pay settlements with staff, how we change prices and so on. And I, I, I never felt that interest rates were a major influence, even though some of those businesses were significant borrowers. It's really interesting that you mentioned interest rates because it is, like I said, and like you said, the primary way that central banks try to manage inflation these days. But something you said about your own personal experience there reminded me of a stylized fact, which I think has become quite clear in, you know, the, the MMT slash post Keynesian literature, which is that businesses actually aren't that responsive to interest rate changes. Right. So this this idea that you can use them to kind of micromanage the economy, it, it seems to be false. And is that was in line with your experience as well? Well, obviously, the impact of an interest rate change does depend upon the scale of leverage within the business. There'll be some businesses that are so highly leveraged that they will have you know, a significant interest rate changes will have a significant impact upon them because that interest charge will be one of their biggest expenses. But bluntly, inside most businesses, that's not true. Um, and I have accounted for many hundreds of businesses preparing many thousands of sets of accounts, I suspect, in my career. I don't do it very much now, but I certainly used to. And it's never been the case that interest rates have that significantly influenced the outcomes. And I'm talking about business here from employing many hundreds of people down to you know, micro entities. Um, it just has not been a big enough factor to have seriously changed outcomes. Price changes did, making sure that you, know, you actually did in periods of uncertain prices be, have the flexibility to change price points um, sufficiently and to understand where they were going. That mattered. Uh, pay negotiations mattered. Um, I always had a policy of paying above average pay, so I, uh, and I always felt that was much more important um, than anything to do with interest. 
because actually that was dealing with fundamentals during a period of uncertainty. What I wanted to give was staff greater certainty uh, so that they would offer commitment to the business so we could carry on to supply whatever the customer wanted at a price that they were willing to pay because it give, gave them a quality product. And that would feed through to the bottom line, irrespective of the interest costs we were going to suffer, which was in real terms less significant than actually achieving an outcome in the real world, which reacted to market literally market stimuli in the form of pricing um so i just don't get it that this is the big impact um that is supposedly the case with regard to the cost of capital because let's be blunt stand back from this a bit um economists overemphasize the cost of capital um cost of capital is not a major factor in many businesses and hasn't been for quite a long time because the means of production in most businesses now is not um physical capital um, it's a relatively small capital base, um, low number of fixed investments, high staff investments, significant human capital, um, and maybe intangible assets. But as we discovered when COVID happened, suddenly we can actually totally change the way of working, dissipate the workforce right around the country without any difficulty at all, and yet carry on, which just indicated just how little um, capital actually is now a function inside the supply of much of the business community in the UK. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but the way in which capital exists is very different from that which is influenced heavily by interest rates. Yeah, I, I think in, in general there's uh, an overemphasis on the response to price signals um, within the mainstream of the profession and, and policy making if you think of interest rates as the price of money right um then then it kind of falls under the same umbrella uh and i think another thing is like carbon taxes people uh economists often see overemphasize how much people are going to respond to price signals over other incentives and other structures um so that's a really interesting point uh what, i absolutely yes. agree on carbon taxes by the way completely yeah. agree on that do you? Yes. So let, actually, OK, so let's let's talk a little bit more about the Green New Deal, because it's interesting. Some of my US uh, viewers won't necessarily realize that the Green New Deal came from the UK um, and it was an idea first put forward by uh, the New Economics Foundation, as well as um, people like yourself and, and Anne Pettifor that you mentioned. Um, and this was basically a completely different vision of how to change the economy and shift it away from the use of carbon um, and also make it more resilient for crises like the ones we've just faced, right? Yeah, indeed. Um, Andrew Sims was at the was another member of the group and he was, I think, chief economist. I, I, I might be wrong there, but I think he was chief economist of the New Economics Foundation at the time. I mean, Andrew was there for around 20 years, perhaps a bit less. Um, and, you know, I'd known him for a long time. He was one of the absolutely you know, integral members of the group. So NEF provided us with the sort of institutional foundation of it. Uh, what happened in 2017 when um, the, the Green New Deal crossed the Atlantic effectively and AOC picked it up was that they came over to the UK. They actually met Anne Pettifor, um, whose view of the Green New Deal is slightly different from my own because she has a different interpretation of what MMT and money is from mine. Um, I don't truly understand hers, but I know it's different from mine. Um, and I'm, I'm just being quite honest about that. I'm not trying to be awkward. Um, and the ideas which were in the original Green New Deal were literally picked up shifted across the Atlantic and have done a great job, a more effective job in many ways, stateside than they ever did here. Um, it still is going on in the UK. There are groups like Green New Deal Rising who are still doing stuff. I'm working with Colin Hines, who is still the Green New Deal group co uh, convener. But we tend to work together now under something called Finance for the Future. So we work in a slightly tighter grouping. Um, but the ideas continue. Um, that this there is a need for a transformation around sustainability, changing the profile of consumption, refocusing um, away from private consumption into communal consumption. So actually, necessarily, that involves a bigger state, um, rethinking the way in which government is financed, rethinking the role of capital in society, actually trying to rebuild the equation between savings and investment, which has been almost totally lost within the financial system over the last 40 odd years. 
Um, and just forgotten that S might equal I in terms of economic, you know, macroeconomics. Um, thinking about how incentives are provided around saving and investment and everything else. And I was having a discussion recently with a quite prominent um, US academic um, who I'm not going to name because I don't think it would be fair. But um, Danny Blanchflower and I, um, Danny Blanchflower is David Blanchflower, Professor of Labour Economics at Dartmouth College in the States. He and I work together quite a bit now. Um, and he was on the Monetary Policy Committee in 2006 to nine, and so lived through the 2008 crisis there, being a what was considered by everybody to be a thorough troublemaker, but turning out to be right. And we're talking to a load of people about what we should be doing now. And one of the senior academics we spoke to, um, who many people listening will have read his work, and so I've given away gender at least, um, it just said, well, the Green New Deal is the obvious answer. It's the only answer. That's what we have to do. We, we have no other model. Um, we need to rebuild society because the one we've got doesn't work. Uh, the assumptions of neoliberalism that there are free gifts of nature that we can exploit, that's one of its many failings that has now been exposed. We know we can't exploit it anymore. That might have been viable in 1980, but it is not viable in 2022. So this is the way to go. Um, as Larry Elliott put it to um, Colin Hines and me once, well, we didn't mean to come up with a brand new economic uh, way of thinking and uh, a blueprint for society that could be built around that when we came up with the Green New Deal, but by accident we did. Um, and I'm not claiming it was anything you know more than accident, but that's what we did, um, I think. And I think it is still the way we need to go. Um, the questions are, how do we actually reorganize society around achieving that goal of sustainability, which is fundamental to our own survival? Now, I might just see out the existing system at the age of 64. It could be that I'll get through without seeing too many catastrophic um, consequences of climate, at least in the UK, although clearly I'll see them elsewhere in the world. But you know, I have um, sons who are in their early 20s. Um, I'm pretty worried for them. And that motivates me to make damn sure that we try to do something better. I agree completely. I think the Green New Deal is uh, by far the best, maybe the only set of ideas that we have for, for dealing with these kinds of crises. Um, I, I mean, mean what's quite yeah. good version of it, not written by me. I, I, I just go and grab because I know these two. Um, there's a, a version called Our Common Home. I'm holding it up on the screen. I don't know whether that's going to be relevant to yes. a podcast. Clearly it yeah. won't. Um, but this one is produced by Common Wheel in Scotland. And they did a costed version of a Green New Deal for Scotland, which is still, I think, one of the best there is. And there were two versions. There was the Common Home Plan and then our Common Home. And they're really worth looking at because it does actually show that you can actually produce real substantial plans from the bottom upwards to actually deal with this, which look at a society in a fundamentally different way. I believe in their plan for Scotland, by the way. It's one of the reasons why I think Scotland is a sustainable, independent country because they've demonstrated it. And I think we need to be doing that sort of thinking for every country, and it's not happening. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that the government... It's never been so frustrating to be proved right, right? Because the, the <laughs> government, for a long time, the government since the financial crisis have basically done the opposite of the Green New Deal. So not only austerity and cutting spending and not preparing for things um, like pandemics, but also there was the famous example, and it's my favourite or least favourite example, depending on how you want to phrase it, of David Cameron saying, let's cut all the green crap. Um, yeah. And then Commonwealth UK worked out that that's now costing us uh, households in terms of their energy bills and uh, in terms of our energy security. And also it would have been good for the environment as well. So the policies have just been the opposite to what we need. Yep, I agree. David Cameron also said, by the way, that I would uh, create a run on the pound um, because of ideas I wrote in my book, The Joy of Tax, which were picked up by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I think some other Tories have managed that a lot better than I would ever have done it. That that is that is very ironic. I didn't know I didn't know that he said that about about your plan. Yeah, the Tory Party conference that that was the case. Yeah. Oh, okay. My, uh, my moment, yeah. a glory at a Tory Party conference. I won't get mentioned again very often. I suspect. No, that is that is uh, that is a life goal, isn't it? To be uh, mentioned and uh, insulted or, or criticised at the Tory Party oh, conference. Well, I think that's way. a good thing to aim for. 
Um, his actual joke to the conference was also that he had um, read my book, The Joy of Tax, taken it home to Samantha and tried it out and it didn't work. Some of you will get the joke, some of you may not. Um, but think about the word tax. It's not the most interesting three letter word ending in X in the English language. Right. OK, I'm being slow. I don't think I get it. I'll probably get it in like an hour or something. after. The, You're too after young. You're too I, young. Am, Sorry, I too that's young? What it is. am I too young? Yeah. OK. okay. Yeah. <laughs> you won't remember the original book of which I've written, uh, Nick, the title and changed. Oh, slightly. OK. No, I don't actually. Although I can. Yeah. And, uh, having some guesses. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so let, let's talk a little bit more about the current UK government. You said they caused a run on the pound. Um it really astonishes me. I mean, not to defend David Cameron, uh, but I could kind of see what he thought he was trying to do when he implemented his policies. In the case of the trust government, I'm at a loss. I have absolutely no idea what they think they do, they're doing, and, and I don't think they do either. I think you're absolutely right. Look, I don't think that David Cameron probably knew what he was doing, but I think it's fair to say that George Osborne might have done. Um, I don't credit Cameron with much intellectual firepower, but I think George Osborne definitely did have an understanding of where he was going. And I think that is absolutely critical to a good government. Um, I've been working recently with an organisation called the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, which is backed by uh, the IMF, the World Bank and the OECD, which isn't an organisational mix that I would normally think of as being very left wing, um, nor one that actually in my past I might have thought of much about think working with. But in practice, um, there are elements in there which are really quite, I, I wouldn't know whether I call them radical, but certainly definitely far thinking about how we can create sound economic management. And what we've been working upon are principles of sound tax system management. Now, that sort of combines my various campaigning as a tax justice campaign and my role as a chartered accountant who knew tax inside out, my thinking as a political economist. And one of the things that we start off by saying is, what are you trying to achieve? And what are you actually going to use your tax system to do? Now, that builds upon actually that book, The Joy of Tax. Because in there, I said, you know, tax is one of the most powerful instruments available to any government to shape the society uh, for which they are responsible and to set the norms of behaviour through influencing through the influence of the tax system that they wish to encourage. So you can encourage marriage, you can encourage children, you can encourage investment, you can encourage consumption of certain goods and you can discourage um, consumption of others. You can provide a fiscal stimulus, you can encourage exports, you can discourage imports, you can do a lot of things with tax um, which are powerful. They're not all powerful. It can't do everything. But it does require you to actually work out what the hell you're trying to do, bluntly. And if you don't know what you're trying to do, being putting somebody in charge of those pretty powerful levers is going to leave you with something close to an economic catastrophe on your hands. And that's what we're doing. I don't think anyone since Brexit has known what they're trying to do. Um, clearly, Theresa May, who didn't want Brexit, um, ended up totally confused, not knowing how to deal with it. Trust, in many ways, is the same. It's perfectly obvious she did not want Brexit. Um, she thought it was economically mad, and now she claims it's the salvation to everything. Um, Boris Johnson had no plan whatsoever. And what is the plan that Kwarteng and Truss have and you know, around the Britannia Unchained theme? Well, it is to release quite clearly the Tufton Street, uh, Tufton Street agenda on us all. Fundamental market liberalisation, going back to Hayek, going back to Friedman and the whole Mont Pelerin society um, rollout of neoliberalism through the think tanks to the point where they could un remove the, first of all, the democratic underpinnings of society in a sense. And secondly, the degree of order that good governance and the government bring to society to actually provide the fundamental underpinnings for a market economy, which it appears they want to destroy. She, and, and let's be honest, I was also saying Theresa May before her and Johnson before her, um, have had no idea of what they're trying to achieve. I mean, she, I, I could move on in her case and say, of course, she's trying to deliver the Tufton Street agenda of Mont Pelerin society, fundamental market um, behaviour expressed in Britannia Unchained, 
Um, and you could say that's what she's trying to deliver, and that is destabilizing its own right, of course, because one of the consequences of that would be to remove the governance and government underpinnings of stable markets, which may be one reason why we have had such a significant reaction in the UK to the current round of crisis, which is obviously completely out of step with that of all other countries. Nobody else has suffered since late September what we've suffered in the UK. And I don't think anyone is going to put that down to the death of Queen Elizabeth II, that they're suddenly the era of King Charles III is what caused this, because that's obviously not true. So it must be some other factor. The only obvious cons uh, factor is Truss and Quartang. And they have delivered this completely ridiculous mini statement. And you simply can't. I mean, it's just absolutely impossible. I mean, whether you're an accountant or an economist, you should have known this. And there are surely the Tories of just all people absolutely in government should have known this. You can't announce two things. One is on September the 22nd that the Bank of England is going to sell 80 billions of quantitative easing bonds back into the financial market, which is what Andrew Bailey did that day. And the next day, have Kwasi Kwarteng say to the House of Commons, I'm going to run a deficit which is going to be around 200 billion or so, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending upon the cost of the energy support package. Um, and that takes, by the way, into consideration the unfunded tax cuts, if we wish to call them unfunded, the energy support cap and the existing round of deficits, plus a few other odds and ends. And then say, oh, that means that in total, the government and the Bank of England are going to look to the markets for 300 billion of um, guilt subscriptions, government bond subscriptions over the following year are some utterly unprecedented in UK economic history, but not explain how, why you're going to do that, at what rate you're going to do it, why the Bank of England is choosing this to do, to do this at the same time as a record deficit is being run that you are a joined up organisation that where the left hand knows what the right hand is doing at the same time and everything else. Um, it was just a recipe for disaster from the moment he did not provide a support package. And if as a chartered accountant, I presented to a board a profit and loss account saying we're all going to have a wonderful time, but there was no cash flow and no balance sheet to support it, which is what Kwartang fundamentally did. Um, they would just laughed me out of you know, the boardroom and say, go come back with a plan when you can show us what the financing implications are, where it's going to come from and whether we are actually going to survive this in terms of solvency. But he didn't do that. Uh, and the Bank of England was left adrift, not knowing, frankly, what it could do to match this up, having almost certainly, in fact, I can guarantee it, having sought permission from the Treasury to do the quantitative tightening programme, the sale of QE bonds back into the market that it planned, um, because nothing happens on QE and QT without Treasury permission, whatever is said about Bank of England independence. And so there was just this total failure to coordinate and plan. And th that continues. We've seen it in the, you know, the few days before we record this, um, even in the 24 hours before we record this. At one moment, we were having the Bank of England providing as much support as markets needed. That was about 24 hours ago before I'm talking now. By late on the same evening, Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England, was saying, I'm withdrawing all facilities within a couple of days. And then during the course of the night, the Bank of England in London saying, well, maybe the governor's got that slightly wrong. We'll provide support again by nine o'clock in the morning. Um, yet another U-turn. No, we are sticking to what the governor said. Um, and who knows where we are now, <laughs> except that interest rates have risen over the last few days by more than two percentage points on 10-year government bonds, uh, which is quite extraordinary and exceptional and reflects the pricing of risk because Kwasi Kwarteng and Bailey, I would suggest, to do not between them, have a clue what they're trying to do achieve. Yeah, that is a lot, by the way, um, just for people who, because, you know, two, two percentage points to somebody who's not used to talking about monetary policy might not sound like a lot. On the long term government bonds, it, it's a lot. <laughs> it's mega. I mean, it's unprecedented since... I don't know when we last had a 2% increase over that short period of time. Well, it was 1992, I guess, so it's 30 years. And that was because of the specific circumstance of coming out of what was called the European exchange rate mechanism, mm. um, which basically left the Tory party's economic credibility in tatters at that time, from which it never recovered and gave us 13 years of Labour government. So 
Um, well, I mean, let's let's hope that that will happen again. Um, I, I'm not optimistic, but yeah, I I think so. I th this has been called MMT for the rich, and so a couple of people in chat kind of mentioned that that even Liz Truss actually seems to sometimes adopt some of the rhetoric of MMT. Um, there's also the notion. I mean, these are competing notions, I suppose. Now that I say it out loud, but there's also the notion that they're basically just cutting taxes because they want to uh, force themselves to make spending cuts down the line. So, I mean, what do you think of those two competing notions, or, or do you see them as competing, those two interpretations of what the government's doing? I think there is, an, uh, dealing with the second one, if you like, first, and I'll come back to the MMT point. Um, the one that this is about the government actually trying to set up a scenario where she's going to have to do spending cuts to undermine the quality of public services and, of course, lay the ground in many cases for privatisation. Indeed, there has been an announcement again today, um, the day we're recording, um, where the in-house labour supply organisation of the NHS is apparently to be privatised. It employs 90,000 people working in the NHS and they're now to become sort of a third party employment agency. Um, God knows why. Um, you can only imagine the benefit is to provide an additional income stream to the private sector at cost of the state sector. Um, it cannot improve efficiency, I'm damn sure. But you know, there is this in inherent logic that they have, which is neoliberal to its core, that um, the, the government cannot do as well what the market ca can because there are no price signals, they say. The fact is there are no price signals in the NHS, the same as there are no price signals in state education. By the way, there are no real price signals inside um, much of the transport market because the comparators between, for example, train travel and uh, driving by car are ones that most people can't manage um, because of the different basis of calculation, um, one being a very marginal cost and one being a an attempt at full cost recovery. Um, there are so many factors in there that can't can't be estimated by price signals. Um, so she is trying to do something that is makes no inherent sense, is what I'm going to say. And But the idea is to lead to privatisation and crushing the size of the state. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Is this MMT for the rich? Look, I think I understand modern monetary theory fairly well. Randy Ray was once kind enough to say I was one of the few outside the core MMT group who has contributed to modern monetary theory by my work around MMT and tax. Um, so I guess I know something about it. I certainly know some of the players in it quite well, and I've lectured at Bard College. So I, I, again, I take that as some indication that I guess some people think I know it. Um, but MMT in my book is is actually politically neutral. Um, so MMT can be for the rich or the poor, um, because MMT is not a policy programme. It is a description of how money actually works inside the economy, how money is created, how it relates to the way in which the cycle of macroeconomic control takes place. Um, I mean, it is one of the ways in which you can interpret the formula that government spending equals T for taxation plus B for borrowing if you want, or I'd rather use D for deposit taking because I don't think the government does actually borrow, and alpha M, which is the change in the money supply. Um, now, I'm happy to you know, explore that idea in depth. The point I'm making is that actually, when you look at what, for example, Bill Mitchell adds onto this, which is, of course, a job guarantee, and I know he's not alone. Stephanie would be one of the others who argues that that's a key component of it. But I think that is standing back some as somebody who didn't create MMT, but actually got there um, by pretty much my own thinking and then realizing that there was a body of work which was remarkably similar. Um I don't think the job guarantee is actually core to MMT. I think it is a logical extension of MMT, which is different from being core to MMT, and that MMT can be abused. Indeed, one of the things that I've spent quite a lot of time over the last decade saying is that MMT would be used by a Tory chancellor. Um, I originally thought it would be George Osborne. Um, and now we're getting to the point where actually at the dispatch box in the House of Commons today, Chris Phillips, who is the number two at... The Treasury was asked by a Tory MP, is the Shadow Chancellor right to say that the current interventions by the Bank of England in the financial markets to support 
the gilt market actually a cost to the taxpayer or is it being done with money created by the Bank of England um, and therefore no cost to the taxpayer? And Chris Phelps, um, who I don't consider to be one of the world's giants of intellect, said, well, actually, there is no cost to the taxpayer unless there's a profit or loss earned on this. The profit then actually going to the Treasury and the loss going um, as a cost to the Treasury. But that's as far as it goes. Um, this is money creation. And so he's confirmed that they do understand exactly what they're doing. And MMT is in operation, in effect, under the guise of Q QE here, quantitative easing, which is an observed process of you know, buying and selling gilts quite unnecessarily. Um, just doing an asset substitution exercise, um, which does create artificial profits and losses and is not required. It could all be done by overdraft on what is called the consolidated fund account maintained by the government with the Bank of England instead. But they do understand that. I, I'm not convinced that um, the opposition, Labour, do really get their head around that, as far as I can see. And of course, there are many inside Labour who deny it completely. People like James and Meadway, who, you know, I was not in agreement with during the Corbyn years, um, who completely says that if you are in favour of MMT, then you have to be a far right winger. There is, it's impossible, he says, to support MMT and be a left winger. Well, I, I, I don't get that because I can assure you I am. Um, a supporter of MMT, and I'm certainly left of centre. Um, it's been very hard for someone to think otherwise, having ri written or read what I've written. But um, so there are conflicts here, but I think we need to actually understand that MMT is capable of being used by the right as well as the left. What we have to do, come back to the start point of this, which is our politicians need to work out what they're trying to achieve. Um, and you can't just go blind into a crisis and say, which lever shall I pull now? Um, you've got to understand what consequence you want from pulling that lever before you actually apply pressure to it. And I don't believe that Trust or Quartank really have the faintest idea, except destruction in this sense. So maybe they don't want a positive outcome. Maybe I was right in the tweet I mentioned earlier. You know, maybe they are doing disaster capitalism, and maybe that is the outcome they wish for. I hope not, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do tend, I do tend to agree. I think MMT also potentially sparks an interesting conversation which is obviously close to what what you've been doing for for a long time which is you know what is the purpose of taxes and how do we use taxes um and i, I you know i i would ask you i'll ask you a slightly more specific question which is you know how would you how would you you know use taxes in the current crisis how do you think they could be a valuable tool for us you know do you do you see tax cuts or um tax rises or a mixture of both or do you think maybe taxes aren't that helpful in the current crisis well the first thing i do in the current crisis is um announce a hundred billion qe program um so not a tax program at all uh why would i do it because or perhaps even before I did a 100 billion um, QE program, I cancelled the Bank of England's quantitative tightening program. I would overrule that. Um, you know, let's just play fantasy chancellors for a moment. Um, chancellors can overrule the Bank of England under Section 19 of the Bank of England Act 1998. They can declare that there's an economic emergency. I don't think anyone would really heavily doubt that at the moment. And then they can actually say to the Bank of England, well, whatever you want to do, we can overrule you. And I think quantitative tightening should be off the table right now um why 100 billion of qe because we have a crisis around energy um created fundamentally we could argue by a wartime scenario not just but quite significantly by a wartime scenario um and in wartime situations as you know, once um, john maynard cain said you know everything changes um, and you literally have to change your economic thinking to react to it. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't react, as we did in 2008-9 and in 2020-21, um, and say QE does fit into the game here at the moment. There's an absolutely essential emergency reason for providing additional state spending to support people, therefore QE is appropriate, and the cost of that should be covered by a QE programme. So not all the government deficit, but that part attributable to energy could be covered. The immediate impact of that would be to take enormous pressure off interest rates because the markets would not be funding 80 billion, which the Bank of England wants to sell back in the next year, and it wouldn't be funding 100 billion for energy. So it'd only be left with 120 billion at most to fund. And it was already expecting to fund 70 to 80 billion without too much stress. Um, if you actually then cancelled the tax cuts of 40 odd billion, in fact, we'd be back where we started. 
Um, so I think that would be my immediate way of actually taking the pressure off financial markets and pre pressure off interest rates and restoring some stability to that market and actually taking pressure off households, therefore, with, who are facing these most extraordinary um, demands for increases in mortgage payment, which many will not be able to afford. We face the most horrendous potential housing crisis in the next year because of increases in mortgage costs and rent costs because so many landlords are heavily geared to, with regard to their mortgages a market by the, by the way where gearing does really have a significant impact unlike most other market sectors so th that would be my immediate reaction is is not a tax reaction why would i ha then use a tax reaction because i would um, well, I would actually look right across the scale um, and say, hang on a minute, we are in a situation where there's very clearly a crisis, um, where some are doing quite nicely and others are doing extremely badly. Um, we're facing a situation where it's very obvious that inequality is growing. We need to address that very obviously for the sake of the building of unity within society for a very large part. If you understand MMT, you realize that tax doesn't actually fund government spending. Um, one of the reasons, I have six reasons for tax, um, all of which begin with R. I'm not going to run through all of them now, but one of the reasons is to do um, redistribution of income and wealth within society. Um, and you do that not because you need to raise revenue per se, which is something that Stephanie Kelton has made the point about many times. Um, you are instead doing it to actually indicate that there is a problem in inequality in itself. And the biggest problem with inequality in itself at the moment, which is being fueled by trust, is that actually money that is directed towards the wealthy is almost always saved. Why? Because actually they're wealthy because their marginal income is not needed by them to live upon. Uh, and therefore they save it. That's why they're wealthy. It's really not rocket science to work that one out. Um, they have an excess which they don't need to spend. If they don't need to spend it and you, at the same time you're trying to create an economic stimulus because your economy is at risk of actually having an economic downturn, which is going to re lead to significant levels of unemployment because of the reduction in demand for those what I might call second round businesses when we look at the multiplier effect. Uh, the first round businesses are where the government spends money into education and the NHS and all sorts of other issues and where also we have the manufacture in the private sector of core commodities like energy, like transport and so on. But when we look at the second round businesses, which are pubs and leisure and cafes and entertainment of all sorts and music and gigs and everything else, all of those are really second tier. Um, they, are, they, they arise as a result of the spending of people who've been involved in first tier activities which is like the core fundamentals the needs of life and they're then the wants of life um, if you can wish to rank things in that way we face the risk that many of those wants of life businesses are going to be wiped out because there isn't going to be demand for them because people will not have sufficient discretionary spending available to actually keep them in business so what we need to do to actually not guarantee growth, but simply to guarantee stability is to reallocate um, income from those who actually will only save any marginal benefit they get from the current situation, whether that be from an energy subsidy, which they don't need, um, or whether that be from a tax cut, which they don't need, towards those who desperately need it. So in fact, again, I wouldn't go taxes next, I'd go benefits next, I would be increasing those in line with inflation, I'd probably be restoring the £20 universal credit cut that was taken away after COVID was over, and which we know made such a significant difference to households during that period. They survived much better then than they have done since. So I would be looking at doing that. Then I would be looking at cutting the rates of national insurance and income tax for those on lower incomes. Um, I do think there is opportunity for lower introductory bans on both those taxes without having a significant overall exchequer cost, in other words, a significant reduction in total tax yield, but increasing significantly the marginal capacity to spend in those parts of the community where people are living on that type of income, which has a massive increase in their well-being and access to society, which to me is absolutely fundamental. That is really at the core of what drives a great deal of my economic thinking. The integration of people into society said that everybody has a chance to take a full part um, to the best of their ability in the opportunities that are available to them to enjoy, but which are being denied to them at present. And I would be doing that by looking at literally doing an active redistribution program, um, not for revenue purposes, but as 
I say, simply to redirect. And how would I do that? I would be looking not at a wealth tax because wealth tax would take far too long to introduce. I think it would take six years at least probably to introduce a wealth tax by the time you went through all the consultation processes and design and implementation. I would be equalising capital gains tax rates and income tax rates. It's incredibly simple. I would introduce an in investment income surcharge to income tax. We had one until 1985. I'm old enough again to remember actually seeing this in operation. You paid 15% extra income tax if you got your income from things like rents or savings and investments and dividends and trusts and compared to the income tax rate you paid if you were in employment. Why do you do that? Because you don't pay any national insurance if you get any income from those investment sources. Therefore, to literally equalise, broadly speaking, the tax rate paid between investment income and labour income, you need to actually charge an extra income tax on those who have investment income sources to make a level playing field. We live in a world where quite Quite bizarrely, um, the return from labour is taxed much more highly than the return to capital from capital. That makes literally no sense at all. Um, the shirkers are quite clearly, um, if we were to follow George Osborne's line, not those who aren't getting up out of bed to go to work, and there are almost none of those anyway, because the benefit system really does not allow that. If anybody understands the benefit system, they'd know it. But instead, they're the people who actually can live off investment income and not pay a proper tax contribution. So I'd do that. I would extend the corporation tax rate. I would increase it now. I think a minimum corporation tax of 25% would do no harm. I would increase the rate of capital allowances, corporation tax reliefs, particularly for larger companies, so that they would be encouraged to invest more. And of course, the investment allowance would be worth more if the tax rate was higher. In fact, having a tax rate of 30% and a higher investment allowance has a much stronger incentive to deliver growth than having a tax rate of 17%, which trust wants, and a, and a lower investment allowance, because there's almost no incentive to invest. It's like marginal petty cash at that level, um, the difference it makes. So I would be changing the corporation tax system. I'd also be preventing some of the opportunities that are available for the wealthy to hide their income in corporations so that they pay tax at lower rates. Um, there used to be a thing called um, close company rules for corporation tax. If a company was owned by five or fewer related people, so you know, a related person would be you, your brother, your sister, your mother, your auntie, your dad, your uncle, um, and various others. Um, they all count as one person, by the way, if you were one of those people. Um, you've got to have more than five people, um, therefore five different families potentially owning a company before you break out of these rules. And if you try to hide your money in a company, you're actually deemed to have paid it to yourself and be subject to income tax rules on it. So you can't just use companies to hide your income away to pay a lower tax rate. Do those things, all of which have got precedents, all of which have got systems which were established and were in use at one time, and therefore are easy to re-establish again now. Indeed, some of the legislation even still exists, like closed company rules, um, just not used. Uh, and you could then end up with a very significant change to the taxation of capital in this country very quickly and re-establish a more fair society. You would be sending out a signal that we are actually trying to create equality. Um, and what else would I do? I'd look at increasing child benefits in some way as well, um, because I think there's a really serious problem there. But I'd start straight away with free school meals um, for all children, and I would actually include breakfast in that. Um, because I think there's such a problem in society at present. We're for some parents providing free school meals. And I don't believe in differentiating between children. I might well choose to differentiate between wealthy taxpayers and those who need support from the benefit system. But do you, well, there we're talking about adults. I think children shouldn't suffer the risk of discrimination at school because we all know that bullying is a factor of school life. Um, I doubt if there's anyone on this call who didn't at some point either see or witness it in some way or even suffer it in some way at some time. And therefore, we want to remove that risk. So we provide free school meals for everyone in state schools and a free breakfast if they want it, because a child with a full tummy simply learns better, as my teacher friends tell me, and I believe them. So there's a fairly radical but fairly quick program which you could put in place now to redress the balances and at the same time provide the answer to the markets how you're going to fund it. Because most of that is about redistribution or cutting significantly the demand on the markets for support to deliver extra bond funding at this point of time. And they should therefore be happy that this is actually a, a program for growth 
with that money reallocated to those on lower income, providing the maintenance opportunity for the jobs that we need to prevent an increase in unemployment, the failure of SME companies, and the increase in demand for benefits as a result. It is a self-balancing equation as a consequence. Yeah, that's, I mean, that all sounds pretty compelling. I think, uh, you know, the, you're kind of proving the, the joy of tax, uh, to, to, to go back to your, your earlier joke. But um, I think... One thing which you have you have kind of answered this. I can see how what you said answers this, but I just want to emphasize the point that sure we were really un underprepared for this crisis, as we've detailed earlier. We didn't have the infrastructure in place. You know, everything has gone as wrong as it could possibly have gone. Um, but the end result of that is that there is now a scarcity, right, of certain things. Uh, in real resources, you might call them. That's what a mainstream economist would call them, uh, or an MMT, to be fair. And your your proposal is very distributive. It proposes to ameliorate the burden on lower income households while also taxing higher income households, so presumably reducing their their consumption. Do you see a need for any? austerity um, by which i mean not the 2010 conservative policy but the more general sense of the term austerity and how we use certain things such as energy such as the things affected by the pandemic is there any type of need for that to try and manage inflation no i'd say there's the exact opposite um for example one of the great problems that our economy has is a lack of productivity which is in itself inflationary because we actually import goods from outside the UK as substitutes for UK products which we don't think are acceptable in quality or in price because we are over investing labour into some outputs. Why do we have a problem with productivity in this country? Quite simply because we have vastly too many people waiting to go into hospital for an appointment who are living with pain or anxiety as a consequence or who are simply unable to work because we've ignored the consequences of long COVID. And if we actually invested significantly more in the NHS, we could massively improve our UK productivity by actually having fit, healthy people at work. If we supported people by providing a better social safety net, they can take the risk of going to work for an employer who might look a bit dodgy. Bluntly, I've done some startups in my time, and I always wondered how people had the confidence to work for some companies where somebody had a wacko idea, we put forward a business plan, we raised a bit of money from somebody, and we hoped that it would work. Um, and some of them did very well, um, let's be clear, and one or two inevitably weren't exactly flyers. Um, nobody got hurt in the process, but people take risk of employing, being employed by such people, and it's a massive risk. And my answer is that actually, if we provide a better social safety net to people to actually go and work in those situations, we will see a greater rate of return to intellectual capital, which is much more important than a return to financial capital, because we would innovate faster. And most of those small businesses actually are about some form of intellectual innovation at the end of the day. And so we actually need to support society more to provide the strong underpinnings for the types of commercial sector that we need, um, whilst actually probably expanding the size of the state sector, because it has more things that need to be done than it, clearly at present it is doing. And the consequence of that attempt at expanding the state sector will be an overall bigger economy. But at the same time, and I make the point very strongly, let me put forward another idea to you and some very simple numbers. Um, I think we need to spend a significant amount of money creating a significant number of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs potentially, on investing in the transition to be a sustainable economy. How do we do that? Uh, I've got a very simple answer to you. 80% um, or more of all financial worth in the UK is in tax incentivized assets. And that number holds true whether you look at the 12 trillion or so of total assets or the 7 to 8 trillion of financial assets that exist in the UK, i.e. knocking out property uh, from the equation. Um, surprisingly, the ratios are really not that different. 80% uh, of assets incentivized by tax are basically pension funds, ISAs, various forms of venture capital trusts and things like that. Um, and they therefore obviously massively um, influence asset allocation by individuals within the UK. Um, you know, whatever else you talk about, um, the primary goal of individuals who provide the money to asset investors is actually, do I get tax relief on this or not? 
So we need to change the way in which we use tax relief. If I said that ISAs were only available in the UK if you put your money into a bond that was to then be invested as the capital in a green investment bank, and that bond would be a three-year savings bond, it would be guaranteed to pay back your money at the end of the period, plus a fixed interest rate, um, you know, 3% or something at the moment, um, uh, would it work? Um, and that 3% would be tax-free because it's an ISA. Uh, yes. How do I know that? Because £70 billion a year goes into ISA accounts each year at present in the UK, which seems absolutely crazy. Be you bonkers that that much money is going into ISAs, but that's what it does. The government's produced the statistics. And year in, year out, the amount of money in ISAs goes up. So it isn't as though we're going to have a sudden run on ISAs because we're making them green. People actually will save in that way. It's a savings account. The fact it's going to be used as the capital, literally restoring the old idea that savings equals investments, which has completely disappeared from banking and all, other, all forms of intermediary market, as MMT would explain, and recreating an intermediary capital market, in effect, by doing that and doing the same with pensions. Um, well over 100 billion a year goes into pensions a year. And astonishingly, the state subsidy for that is nearly 60 billion a year. So for basically, for every pound going in, 50p of tax relief is given in some way or other, directly or indirectly. And that's a staggering amount of government spending. 60 billion is, you know, the, the entire defence budget is what we spend subsidising pensions a year in the UK. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, and of course, that subsidy goes almost entirely to the wealthy, uh, because the vast majority of pension wealth is owned by people in the top 20 percent of the income profile. Uh, vast majority, not all, but vast majority. And so you need to change the incentives for pension investment and again require that, say, a quarter of all new money going into pensions, new money, not existing money, just new money um, going into pension funds should go into green related investment to create jobs and to provide for the funding for the transition in our society. If you did that, we could provide over 100 billion a year, as I suggest the need to be, to fund the transition that is necessary to deliver a sustainable society. And I've just solved another problem. First of all, I've created secure long term employment with apprenticeships, trade union representation, fair wages throughout the com uh, country. Um, I provide an incentive for UK businesses to invest long term to provide the equipment and the materials that are needed for those programs, whether it be offshore, onshore, wind, tidal solar panels, insulation, etc. Um, we're talking about, therefore, fundamentally new transmission systems. And again, we could encourage a domestic market for those things. All of that could be done by changing this relationship around the way in which we use tax incentives for saving rather than tax itself. And that's how you need to think about these things in a joined up way. Now, the answer is, therefore, we don't need austerity. We actually just need to think how we can actually manage our economy better. Um, austerity is the preserve of the person who's run out of ideas. I clearly haven't run out of ideas, as I hope I've demonstrated in the last half hour. No, definitely not. Um, I mean, yeah, so essentially just when you've got these kind of issues and, and supply constraints, what you want is to invest and induce innovation, whether that's you know directly state-led or whether it's in the form of incentives for um, green investment, like you said with the ISAs, or the incentives for small business creation and things like that. That's what you that's what you want there to do. There would be and that's a the real way. partnership relationship inside these. That have to be the Green Investment Bank would be a partnership bank between state and private sectors. Some of it would be in state-owned enterprises. Some of it would start as state-owned enterprises and then create a fledgling offshoots which may be private sector enterprises some would be pure private sector it would be fundamental to build relationships around a state private partnership and i do genuinely believe that can work but not in the way at the moment we have the narrative of politics which is the left still too often are not willing to embrace the idea that there is some merit in the private sector because there is some merit in the private sector i've run private sector businesses which have been extremely fair employers and some are not all of course and we need to get rid of the cowboys and we need to get rid of the outsourcing people who are only there to exploit minimum wage labor and so on but we need to actually create that idea there is merit and again we want to eliminate and prove we can eliminate the right-wing idea that oh all lefties only know how to waste money and don't know how to actually produce something of value value is created in partnership between people state and private sector and I believe that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, I tend to agree with you. And I think a positive vision of, of the state and the private sector 
together that isn't just you know sort of introducing the private sector and market mechanisms in a basically corrupt and <laughs> sort of uh, yeah. uh, 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 cack handed manner let's say uh, would be would be really good to see. I mean, it, it sounds a bit like Mariana Mazzucato's kind of entrepreneurial state vision. I'm right? not disputing that. I think there is some, some clear overlap. I mean, I'm, God, I'm not unique. I haven't come up with everything I've done by myself. I mean, I've mm. got influencers from all over the place. But, for example, that idea about pensions and ISIS is one that is one that Colin Hines and I have been working on for a while. We think it could work. We don't see why not. And I've backed it up with some academic research on wealth and how that can be used in this way. So that is you know, an original idea. But of course, it's not something that I'm talking about alone. It would be incredibly important to, again, to bring in all those different strands of thinking to make sure that we can pick the best. Well, there is a lot of promising thinking on the left, and there has been. And you know, it's mm. come from Matsukata, it's come from people like yourself, it's come from the NEF, you know, and and a, yeah. a whole range of other people, um, which we should we should display it more proudly, I think, and talk about it more. Um, Richard, I am very conscious that we've gone well over yes, the time that you were not it. Yeah, uh, I'm very thankful for you for coming on the the show at all and also for staying a little bit longer than you said it's been really really interesting um so thank you very much thank you i've enjoyed it great and uh, i will see you later everybody uh so i'll finish the stream now